Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 16 of the Realtor Nation podcast. My name is Ian Hoover, and I am the host of this podcast, and I'm very excited to bring to you the Realtor Nation, a show to help you improve your business. Today's episode is very special. We have a guy coming in who is making major moves in the Pittsburgh real estate market, and we're going to sit down and talk to him and hopefully learn some things that we can implement into our own businesses. So I'm very excited to have Jesse Wig with me. He is the one of the owners of Life Space, which is a real estate brokerage here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And he also is the sole owner of Atlas Estates. Correct. Okay, yep. I got that yep. right. There it is. Um, doing some big things. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, thanks for being here and actually coming to uh, Carnegie. A little bit of a drive for you. Yeah, not bad. Not bad. So tell us a little bit about how you got started in real estate. Okay. You know, I have a bad habit of telling really long stories. That's um, good. We so like long stories. I'm going to do my best to summarize it, um, which won't be short. But about, um, I went to school for criminal justice. I have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. And I was working in that field for probably about like three years. And it was a pretty negative atmosphere. And I got over it pretty quick. So I had a buddy that was in Pittsburgh. I was living in Erie, Pennsylvania at the time. I had a buddy that was in Pittsburgh flipping houses. And I said, hey, man, I want out of my job. Like, can, what can you offer? Like, do you, can I come work with you? And he's like, I can pay you 10 bucks an hour to like do punch list stuff on houses. Okay. So I quit my job. Not that I was counting it, but I was on salary. I could sleep at that unit and get paid. You know, like there was good things happening on like a professional side. So I quit that job. And for six months, I drove back and forth from Erie, Pennsylvania to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is about a two hour drive. Mm-hmm. So I drive down and I would work long days and just doing like all this punch list stuff, you know? And, um, there was, there was one specific moment when I was there that I questioned if I did the right thing because, um, we found, uh, or, or Chris is his name. He found tile, like three layers down in this house that was like one inch by one inch tiles in a 10 foot by 10 foot kitchen. And the agent at the time was like, you have to keep these original tiles. They're so huge. Well, every grout line was like pure black, you know? And so they like tried acid cleaners, this and that, and like, it's not going to work. So so what I had to do was I, I laid on my chest on a pillow for a week and uh, used a dental tool and I scraped out all those grout lines. And at that point I was like, why did I quit my job? You know, what am I doing? Wait, wait. So like 40 hours of you on your stomach with a pillow. <clears throat> yeah. Scraping. It was literally awful. And here's the thing. What was probably worse about it was that, um, I mean, it was in the middle of the winter. I had the heat on, like cranking, but those tile floors were so cold that I would put like long sleeves on my arms and like put pillows on my chest because I was laying on it. It was so cold. So, um, but at, yeah, at that point I was like, what am I doing? You know, but anyways, I worked with Chris, his name's Chris Bennett, um, for six months, um, on that house. And I was like, Hey man, I want to flip a house. And he's like, Oh, just find some private money and do this, do that. So I'm up in Erie living there. I remember I was driving back and forth, found a house. Uh, I met, I met an agent. Uh, her name's Marissa who's now my fiance. Uh, okay. Yeah. And, um, met a, met an agent and she found me a house, um, bought the house, coordinated some private money. Um, me and my buddy flipped this house from YouTube videos. Um, and basically anything and everything that could go wrong did go wrong. I had no experience. Um, you know, I didn't calculate for closing costs and, and our carrying costs and, um, I didn't calculate for going over budget, literally everything. I knew nothing, you know? And when that house did eventually sell, I lost $43,000 on the first house I flipped. You lost $43,000? I did, yeah. So, well, tell me about this. So how did you, you know, it sounds like you weren't really well off financially. So how did you overcome a $43,000? Yeah, just, okay, so this is what happened. Okay, bought the house. There's a formula you should, you should go buy when you buy a house. Sure. I, okay. I didn't, yeah. I didn't go buy that formula because a private lender, he gave me money up to 65% loan to value of the after repair value. Well, I went to a buddy and I was like, hey, I need another 20 grand to do these renovations. So right off the get, I was more into the property than I should have been, you know. But after the renovations were done, okay, the, the, the house is done. And when it's finished, I'm living in here at the time. Well, at that point, when it when I finished the house, I didn't think I was going to lose money yet. You know what I mean? It didn't sell yet. I thought I was going to make money still. I thought I was going to sell for like 160 or 170 you know? Um, but I, I knew I wanted to keep going in real estate. And so I got my real estate license and I moved to Pittsburgh right away. So it sat on the market for another like year and a half before it sold. 
and like we were dropping the price, but I was like paying all these closing costs. In the middle of the winter, the window dropped and um, it froze the pipes and it flooded the living area. Yeah. So like, it was just a nightmare. Well, here's the thing. After three or four months of it sitting on the market, I was like, starting to get the indication I'm gonna lose money, okay? And I wasn't gonna have enough money when I come to the closing table to pay everyone back. So at this point, I'm in Pittsburgh, I'm living by myself, my fiance didn't move down at the time. I get my real estate license and I'm not kidding. It was every day, all day, 24 seven, just real estate, okay? working as an agent, meet, meeting with people, networking, learning construction, like doing everything. I knew I wanted to, I knew I wanted to continue to flip, but I knew I needed to learn more, you know? Right. This house didn't sell yet, but I'm gaining a lot of traction as an agent. I'm, I'm doing some good deals. I'm making some decent money. And I knew I was getting prepared to take this hit when the house does sell. So I found a house that I bought for like five grand, but I knew it was worth like 15. I got a good deal there. I paid off my my vehicle at the time. And I was like, okay, when the time comes, it's easy to get car loans. I knew I could sell my vehicle for some cash and get a car loan afterwards. You know what I mean? So when the time came that we were going to the closing table, I, I owned two properties. Okay. I went and refinanced one. I was able to cash out like 20 grand. Um, and then I sold my vehicle that I got like six grand for. And then, um, and then whatever the, I can I came up with like twenty some thousand, like twenty five, twenty six thousand. Okay, and of the forty three, paid that to an investor. And then I said, "Hey, investor, I own this other property. Can you attach a lien to this other property? I own it free and clear. It was worth like fifteen. And then I'll list it for sale. And when that sells, I can pay you back, or I'll just keep paying you back." So luckily, the investor was like, "I mean, he didn't have any options. You know what I mean?" But he attached a lien to another property, and I kept working. And when that sold. I got them all of it back, but like a little bit of money. You wow. know? So it was intense. It was tough. And I always tell people like <laughs> I was, uh, I'm honestly very genuinely happy that I lost money because I learned so much more than if I would have made money, probably could have put myself in a worse situation. However, it didn't have to be 43 grand. Like I would have yeah, preferred it cheaper. Grand. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Right? So, um, but I learned so much. Well, I do always say, uh, you know, I chose the school of hard knocks, especially when it comes to my real estate investing. Like I didn't go get a guru and spend 50 grand. I just lost 50 grand taking action and making decisions I shouldn't have made. Right. So exactly. you just did it all in one deal. When I probably did it over a couple yeah, of years. Yeah, exactly. Right? So, exactly. So at what time, at what point did you get your real estate license in the, cause it sounded like you didn't have it. I didn't have it before. Yeah. I didn't have it when I bought the first flip. Um, as soon as I finished renovations and I, I'm not going to give the exact timeline, but probably about five years ago, or, or maybe it was six years ago when I finished renovation, I moved down here and I got my real estate license like shortly after that. So I've had my, I've had my real estate license for right, somewhere around, I'm starting my fifth year, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Um, so why did you decide to get your real estate license? Well, because I knew that, um, I knew that I wanted to be in real estate and I, I, I knew that I had so much I had to learn. So step one was like, Hey, Take, take my real estate courses just to learn that information, get my license and then, and then have my job, my day to day job be in real estate, you know? So you probably didn't know when you, when you decided to take that action, that the information that you learned from getting your license was never going to be used. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. Okay. Cause that's, that's know. like one of my big, I, I think like right now I think it's up to 75 hours to get your real estate license. Yeah. And I think that at least 25 hours of that should be like, this is how you actually do the job, right? Absolutely. Like, like teach people how to do the job. And maybe they'll just decide they don't want to take their test because they're going to be like, that's horrible. Why do I ever want to do that? Because, you know, that's part of the reason why I do this is because so many people fail in the real estate business. Yeah. Uh, like most people in your scenario there, they would have just filed chapter seven. I'm, I'm out, Absolutely. you know, like I'm never doing this real estate thing again and went back to criminal justice. So yeah. I commend you on powering through that. Thank you very much. Um, so then you get to Pittsburgh and what happens from there? Okay. So I moved to Pittsburgh, get my real estate license. I reconnect with the individual Chris Bennett um, that was flipping houses previously, you know, and I mm -hmm. was working 10 bucks an hour for him. And then, um, I, I start working with him and he had a realtor or an agent at the time that he was listing his renovations, you know, but it didn't take long for me to like swoop in because I was working with him daily and I was working really hard. I was grinding. It's, it's all I did. You know what I mean? Like I didn't have friends or family or anything down here. It's all I did. I loved it. And so it didn't take long for me to get in with him listing his properties, which when you work with an investor as a, as a realtor, you can, you can, 
gain some traction pretty quick. You know, they're buying a lot of houses and they're renovating and they're selling them, you know? So I started working with him and then shortly after I was down here gaining some traction as an agent, he's like, Hey man, he's like, I want to get, I w- I've always wanted to start up a real estate brokerage. And I'm like, I'm loving being a real estate agent. Like I want to be involved in that. So we started life space um, together. Okay. Um, we started life space together and then um, at, as it started out, he was, he hired me as the, um, as the manager, which is kind of a joke because we're just buddies and I have like nine months of real estate. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Um, but so he was paying me a small salary and, but like after, let me get these timelines mixed up. After six months or another nine months, I was like, Hey man, I, I don't want this salary. Like I want ownership in the company. Okay. And so He's like, yeah, for sure. So I gave up the salary and it was kind of scary because now you're just all commission based as a realtor. Right. You know what I mean? It's oh, a absolutely. hard thing to do. But I gave that up and I took 30% ownership in the company, Life Space, and just continued to work as a realtor. And then um, while this is happening, um, or very close, I started to acquire some properties for rental units with my company, Atlas Estates. And, um, but continue to grow life space and I'm going to kind of fast track it here now, um, on the life space side, fast forward life space to now we went back and forth. I went 30% ownership to 50% ownership. And now we're at the point where we got to a point where he's, he's really busy with a lot going on. And, um, we kind of like, Hey, I either need to buy you out or you need to buy me out. So I'm now majority owner. I'm 90% owner of the company life space. Um, but i wouldn't have been able to start at LifeSpace without Chris. I mean, that was him. He's the founder. And, um, but it's just how business played out, you know? So tell me about that. So you got your real estate license and then you wanted to be involved in LifeSpace. So like, like me knowing what I know, building a real estate brokerage, it isn't easy, right? Absolutely. Uh, so why did you want to not only take more equity, but eventually become the majority owner in it when you know that that's pretty much a full-time job in itself. And now you have, how many agents do you have? Uh, 13, I think. Yeah. 13 13. agents that are all dependent on you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So, um, man, I just keep going back this, but I, I love real estate so much that like you have 24 hours in a day. Right. And, um, I go to bed super early, but I also get up very early, you know, and I work really hard. That's all I do. But like real estate is my work and real estate is my play. So I get 16 hours a day or whatever the number is. It's not every single day. You know what I mean? Um, but if I want, I designate eight hours of work and eight hours of play or however you wanted to be that up. So like I knew I had time. I knew it's what I want to be involved in on multiple different levels of real estate. So that wasn't a concern for me. Like the workload wasn't a concern. I knew I was going to be doing it anyways, you know? Okay. So the workload's not a concern. What about like liability? Like why, why wouldn't you just go start a, a team and have like let's just say uh, Keller Williams have them have all the liability and all that. Yeah, I don't know, man. I I didn't realize. I think I'm an entrepreneur at heart, okay. And I didn't know that at all. Um, but looking back, I realized I was even at a young age because I'll tell a story about how I realized I was an entrepreneur. Thinking back is like, so when my parents had divorced, and when they divorced, I, I lived with my dad. Well, it was back and forth, but when I was living with my dad in Titusville, Pennsylvania. Um, it was just bachelors. It was me, my brother, my dad, and he worked a lot. And so he would just buy like hot pockets and pop tarts and, you know, like we wouldn't have cooked meals, but so he would overload our, our cupboards with pop tarts. I'm talking like family size, massive boxes of pop tarts. So there were so many in there. I was like, why does your dad keep buying this? I would take those pop tarts and I would take them to school and I'd sell those pop tarts out of my locker. Like he bought them. I took them to school and I sold them. Then I started to like, Making not much money off pop tarts, you know I mean? but making money off pop tarts. I mean, nothing, you know what I mean? Right. But, but making money off pop tarts, I wasn't buying them and I was selling them. I keep, kept everything. Then I was going to my grandma's and I was young. I was like eighth grade or ninth grade, ninth grade. And um, then I was like, I'm making some money. So I would like go to my grandma's. She would cut out coupons of pop for me. So I'd go buy 24 uh, packs of pop and I was selling pop tarts and I was selling pop and I was selling everything out of my locker and making some money. And then I, um, one day after lunch, uh, it was a frantic, everyone's gathering around Jesse's locker, trying to get pop for the bell rings. And someone knocked a can out and landed and sprayed everywhere. And I got controlled by the principal. He was like, you're not a Walmart. You can't sell. So 
<laughs> I shut down that business, you know. But looking back, like, that's just one story. There were so many different stories that I wanted, like, I was doing my own thing. I was working for myself. And so fast forward to today, I just, I, I'm very confident, whether it's cocky or confident, I know I'm going to be successful. I have this extremely um, intense work ethic and like this drive that I have that I can't tell you exactly why, but it's there and I'm not going to work for someone else, you know? So I think that's where, that's why I just want to do my own thing. Yeah. You know, I, I get the question a lot when people, you know, talk about my brokerage and they're like, why didn't you just go get a franchise? And I'm like, cause that's not mine. You know? That's somebody else's Absolutely. franchise. Then don't get wrong. There's value to it. But yeah. Somebody else's like, I want to build my own, you know? So yeah. I totally get that. Um, it, now when you look at moving forward, like what's your aspirations on the, the real estate brokerage side of things compared to your investing? Cause investing is a huge part of your life. It is. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm at an uh, interesting point in business where I'm trying to grow both of these companies, which we'll get into Atlas Estates in a little bit, but I'm trying to grow both these companies. And um, I've heard people say before, which um, I bowed out a little bit of a, a couple other companies, is that um, it doesn't make sense. I'm going to butcher this. It doesn't make sense to have like five companies and put 20% effort into that many. You know what I mean? And right. so... Um, so I'm at this interesting point where I have two companies and two main focuses right now. And then I think that I need to hire on like on the brokerage side. Um, and, and so that I can help grow that or maybe partner up with someone that is willing and has the time to put that effort in, you know, um, specifically because as estates, which I'm sole owner in and all have always have been is really ramping up, you know, and to be honest with you, I genuinely enjoyed being a real estate agent, but to be a good agent, it's, it is 24 seven, which I don't mind now. I know that in the future it will bother me because I'm putting in the work now to where if I want to retire in five years or 10 years or whatever the number is, I can, I'm sure I won't, but I want to have that option. So I'm transitioning a little bit personally as less of a real estate agent, more of a manager of life space and more of an investor of house estates, you know? Gotcha. Okay. Well, let's talk about your team. Cause I know that just like, me, you're only as good as your weakest link. So how, how's your team structured and, you know, how do you envision it growing moving forward? With, with LifeSpace? Both of them, yeah. Okay. Um, with LifeSpace, um, as I'm sure you've experienced and you learned, you will hire on 10 agents, but uh, 2 or 20% perform, you know? Um, and and it is not, not, it's not a knock to them at all. It's, it's very difficult to gain traction as a, as a real estate agent. You know what I mean? Like oh, yeah. it's all commission based and, and there's 7,000, I don't know what the number is. Some, I think 7,000, there's like 7,500. Okay. Right. Like yeah. So, so it's hard, but, um, we do have a really good group of agents um, and everyone has their own niche. You know what I mean? I mean, we have a couple agents that work specifically with investors or more, a little bit more on a commercial side, not a commercial brokerage, but commercial side of things. We got some agents that are like uh, in certain areas or first time home buyers, you know? Um, but um, I plan on building the team by kind of diversifying and having um, right now we're a young brokerage, but I, I, it's just, that's how it played out. I, I would like to get a little bit of an older demographic um, or, or reach the older demographic that we don't reach now, probably because we have just younger agents, you know? So I'd like to diversify uh, the life space team a little bit in the future. Well, I'm going to kind of call you out a little bit on that. Okay. And don't take offense. No, no, but when no, I go to your it. website, I'm looking around. First thing I did is you're, you're the owner of the company. So I click on you Yeah. and um, you know, like your, your bio, your, your profile in there is really it's specifically, Designed for somebody younger, right? Uh -huh. Like just the way you talk. Yeah, you for talk sure. about Absolutely. being inked up and Absolutely. all this stuff, right? So, uh, but is that a bad thing to just attract the younger clients? No, not at all. Not at all. And I mean, we, we've had a lot of success there, but I also feel like, and I'm, and I'm not trying to like, I think that's our brand. You right. know what I mean? But, um, and, and, and we've had success that way, but I, I don't personally, I don't want to rule out like our other our other consumers or other buyers. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I'm putting myself maybe too much into a niche if we just spoke, focus specifically on them, you know, Absolutely. but, but I also don't want to lose that image of the brand. So it's like walking that line of like keeping this young so how, vibe versus how do you fix that? Though? Do you go and get a couple like older agents? Do you, I think that may be the case. I don't know. Can you case? help me out with that? I'm not sure. I, 
I don't know. I'd have to look at what the <laughs> average age of our demographic is. I don't even know. At least you know. I yeah. really don't know. I mean, we have uh, – I think we're pushing uh, – we're going to be pushing 30 agents here. And, I mean, we're all over the board with what we do. Just like, yeah, you know, like you said, new yeah. investments and some doing uh, residential and stuff like that. But, yeah. Uh, so how is your investment team structured? Yeah, cool. So uh, Atlas Estates, that's a whole other thing. Um, so uh, we, we have um, a small in-house crew. So we were flipping strictly with subs um, and doing renovations. We, we both flip, you know, we buy, renovate, and resell. We buy, renovate, and keep as rentals, you know. So we have 36 units in Atlas Estates. And um, we're specifically focusing on the, the market, the Homestead, Munhall, West Homestead market that I told you about to kind of like, uh, I don't want to wear this. I don't like to say take control, but. Um, <laughs> Come on, you uh, want to own it. You want to <laughs> own that market. Yeah. Okay. Um, understand it and have a good grip on that market, you know. Um, but so. So when we started out, we're subbing everything out and like there are extreme challenges with anyone that's flipped a house or renovated a house. Like, okay, finding good contractors, number one, finding like, okay, you didn't find a good contractor, but like somewhat reasonable price, reasonable price, reliable. Okay. Then, then figure out all those three. Then you need like five or seven or eight different contractors because you got like your electricians and your plumbers and all that. So you need to coordinate their schedules. And then when one guy says it'll be done on a Tuesday, the next guy wants to start on a Wednesday, but he's not, then your schedules are thrown off. You know, there was just scheduling nightmares and, and contractor nightmares. And so I was like, well, why do I not start an in-house construction crew? So my brother, who's been working with me from day one on Atlas Estates, he manages the crew. And so it's someone that I trust. He's obviously very reliable and um, we have a good relationship. And so he's on site. And so we started hiring an in-house construction crew. That way we still sub all our mechanics out. And, and a couple other things here and there, but like they do all the finishing work, you know, we're doing like flooring and framing and well, that's not finishing, but uh, framing and flooring and trim and windows, um, kitchens and baths, you know, but like all our mechanics usually sub some roofs if they're pretty bad, you know, or too steep. <laughs> I mean, a couple other things, but, but we've had great success in that. And so uh, I'm at this point with that as the States where like, I personally think, and this is all opinion based, you know what I mean? But like, I personally think there's like three main elements to what we're doing in Atlas Estates. It's like having enough capital or the funds to work with, um, acquiring the properties and, you know, handling the acquisition side of things. And then it's, um, you know, facilitating the actual renovations. And so currently at this point in our company, like we have a lot of investors backing us as you get better and you prove yourself more, it's a lot easier to find that capital. You know, so it's currently not a problem with the investment side. Um, it has not been an issue acquiring enough properties. I mean, we have more properties coming in than we can handle. And so now, now the growing pains of the company is, um, hiring more in-house construction crew, you know, and it's just difficult finding honest, trustworthy, reliable people. That's it. Yeah. That's, that's some scale. You know what I, mean? I mean, whether you're a real estate agent and investor, one of the biggest headaches is dealing with contractors because they're, they're so unreliable, right? I yeah. Mean, it's, uh, you either get a, a GC who knows what he's doing and, and bends you over, you know, yeah. or you get the guy that's affordable, but you have to chase him down every Wednesday to see where the hell he's at. That's exactly so, right. Why aren't you working on my property? Right that's now, exactly you know? right. Okay. So that's how your team is structured. Now you talk about your brother. It sounds like he's a pretty big part of your team. Huge. Yeah, absolutely. So like, how is his role structured? He's not an equity owner. So. He's not. No, he's, he's just an, uh, an employee of the company. Um, okay. And uh, he, he manages our, our crew, our construction crew. Like, like I said, we, we only have technically four full-time guys. There's a handful of guys that may be, I may be offering a position that's been working with us a lot lately, you know, like two or three more. And then, like I said, a list of subs that we work with regularly. But, but Scott is on, his name's Scott. He's on site daily. Um, he's um, doing the physical construction on the properties and then also jumping around and coordinating like if we have a couple guys over here or one guy over here then he'll stop line up materials this and that so um he he runs a construction crew to day to day honestly younger brother or older brother? he's actually older than me okay yeah all right so you know at first i thought i wondered if it'd be like i'm the boss i'm the younger brother uh it's not it's not an issue really you know it's not okay. an issue at all like you're he's good at construction and i'm good at business it just it just so happened you know the roles we fell into that's it Wow. Okay. Yeah. My, my brother and I, we, we have our ups and downs. Uh, and I, you know, I, I think a lot of it has to do because he is my older brother, but, uh, 
you know, we, we try to work through it the best we can. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We're challenging at times. Keep it rolling. So tell me, uh, you've kind of spoken a lot on it, but from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep, what's a day in the life of Jesse look like? Okay. It jumps around. Yesterday was an awesome day, man. I'll tell you, I'll tell you about yesterday. Sure. Because it was a good day. Um, I wake up early, okay? It, it, it jumps back and forth, but in between five and six, okay? I wake up, and I uh, I spend 30 minutes trying to wake up my fiance or longer to go to the gym. Uh, okay, go to the gym. We do we do some workout. I come home. Um, majority of the time, I go to all my properties that are active properties, um, check in with them. My brother starts at 7. I'll stop. I'll see, hey, any issues? What's going on? Do we need some materials? Do we need to line something up? Project management, you know, what do we need to order coming up soon? Check in with everyone. I'll also coordinate with subs, you know, stop at properties, meet a plumber here, you know, and, and handle those things. Um, and then and then I usually go into the office. I'm at the LifeSpace office for a big chunk of the day, doing some management stuff, helping out with my other agents. Meanwhile, I'm still personally doing my own real estate thing. Like, like yesterday specifically, I put a half a million dollar house under contract for my buyers. And then, um, put another $200,000 house under contract, which uh, representing both sides on so the dual agent. So it, it's a combination of a um, little bit of gym in the morning, a little bit of personal stuff, um, uh, Atlas Estates project managing, flowing into some managing of life space, flowing into being a realtor, personal realtor myself, um, and then uh, having a little uh, family time with my fiance and my dogs, um, okay. you know, at the, at the end of the day. But it's it's an hour or two hours max at night, and then I'm in bed and up and doing it again. What time do you go to bed? I go to bed early. Um, I fall asleep at like there's times I fall asleep as early as nine thirty, but anywhere between nine thirty and ten thirty. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm a I'm a night owl. I, Are you? I have trouble talking myself into anything earlier than eleven o'clock. Gotcha. And then I'm up at four thirty trying to go to the gym so, and oh, do the right yeah, things. Right? No, I I fall asleep early. I get up early, but I fall asleep early. So. If you look at the hours I sleep, it's a lot, you know, seven or eight hours a night usually, but. Well, you're, you're obviously successful, but there had to have been a time where uh, you felt like you were failing. Maybe it was when you lost $43,000 yeah, on your first deal, but talk about uh, the toughest time that you ran into in your career and what you did to power through it and why you powered through it. I don't, I don't think losing a big chunk of cash was obviously a huge hit, right? You know, and that was early in the career, but. I, I, I don't want to pinpoint a specific time that I say this was, this was really difficult. Generally speaking, um, we're talking about things going well and being successful, but we're not touching base on like how hard it is and all the, like the challenges and the struggles with it, man. I mean, I mean, my, to this day, and I think it will be this for a long time because it's my personality to this day, I'll have months where I'm like, if you look at my bank account this month, I'm killing it and right. I'm awesome. And then you look at it next month, it's like, what happened? You know, it's a roller coaster of emotions. It's mentally, mentally draining to be an entrepreneur and like run companies. It's mentally draining. And, and there's personal strain on your relationships and family relationships. And my, my family at first did not understand. They did not agree. I worked every day, all day, you know, but I'm like, listen, like I want to work 24 seven now. So that like in the future, if I don't want to work, I don't have to. And like when you're working a nine to five in 10 years from now and I'm not, you know, like then you'll get it, I think, you know what I mean? But they, they've stopped now, like they get it and they see that my success and it's going well. But, um, let me jump back. Generally speaking, just being an entrepreneur and the challenges of like managing your guys and your money and your cash flow and the ups and downs and the unpredictables, like it is exhausting. Yeah. And it, it's, it's a, it's stress and it's pressure. And, um, you know, now I'm, I'm responsible on out of responsible for four individuals life livelihood. You know I mean? And I'm there. If I don't find properties and make the right decisions and do renovations that, and they don't have a job, like that's on me, you know, there's a, it's a lot of pressure. So I think I would like to say, generally speaking, it can be fun. It can be so rewarding, but it's not for everyone. It's very difficult. And, I think the biggest factor in being successful, in my opinion, is getting your mental state right. And I'm a huge advocate for the power, um, power of positive thinking. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I'm a huge advocate. I read a bunch of those books. But if you don't have a good mindset and a, and a strong mental capacity, then you'll probably fail. So if you can work on like adjusting your mindset and getting your mindset right, 
um, then you can power through any of those challenges that you will face throughout your entrepreneurial life. You know, it's funny. Yeah. So my, my partner and I, we just went to a real estate conference in, uh, in Los Angeles uh-huh. and we're looking at the stage of like all these agents that are up there making millions of dollars a year selling real estate. Right. Yeah. And because of the emotional roller coaster you're talking about, we just both look at each other like, man, maybe we should just like not invest in real estate and just focus solely on selling real estate. Right. Like, yeah. Looks like it's a lot easier because yeah, exactly. you know, there is, there's those moments when you go from, you know, let's just say April, your bank account is a hundred thousand dollars clear in it. And you're like, wow, this is awesome. And then in the end of May, you're at like 1200 bucks. in your account. You're <laughs> exactly. like, what, what the hell just happened? I oh, I had, to, I had to pay payroll and I had to do this and I do that. And it's, it, it can go quick and it's, it's not easy to, to go through that. But uh, yeah, I like that you, you, you don't like to talk about a specific moment, yes. but you, you definitely know there's challenges. Absolutely. And you just got to think positively and keep going through it. Yes, absolutely. You just have some confidence and, and just straight ahead. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So where do you, are you a goal per, oriented person? Absolutely. Okay. So where do you see yourself in five years? Okay, so I, I bought this key holder for rentals. You know, I, I, on the Atlas Estate side, I, I want rentals. I'm flipping now, but it's, it's, just a, it's just to bring in some income to buy more rentals. I want rentals, you know, because I want to have these, these properties in place and just um, a retirement plan in the future. Mm-hmm. But So one of the goals I have now is I got on Amazon. I was looking for, like, maybe, the, I'm sure there's bigger, but I was looking for the biggest key holder that I could find. Um, cause I want every slot filled and it's 400. So, um, one of the goals now is to acquire 400 rental units. Um, and, um, I'm at 36, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a little while away, but, but to be honest with you, it, it starts slow, just like anything. There's a few a year, whatever. And, and like, you know, right now, I mean, we've bought like 16 or 17 so far this year, you know? And so it's, it's been a huge year and like, it, it's, it's rolling. Things can happen, but it's rolling. You know what I mean? And so I, I, I think um, that I'll be able to hit 400 units in the next uh, four to five years. You know, it's funny when, when I first started out, I, yeah, I also buy rentals and I was thinking like, man, I would love to have 25 rentals by the time I'm 40, right? Yeah. 25 doors. Yeah. And to me at the time I was like 24 years old. I was like, I was like, man, this is going to be hard, you know? And then like, by the time I was like 28, I was like, okay, I already hit, 25 units so what Absolutely. what am I going to do now you know what I mean so then I I had to refocus and kind of you know how many so now it's kind of morphed into I want this many paid off doors and this many doors total and yeah uh, but you kind of set those goals so so 400 units you think you can do in, in five years that's the plan it, it's that's recorded plan. now I know I know so it's legit I'm held accountable okay you're held accountable but what I do want to say something about that real fast is that um now I'm just a, a very small investor in this company it's called Bricks Management Mm-hmm. Um, and Justin Repis, he he runs this company, Bricks Management, property management company, and he has my 36 units, or yeah, we're at 36, and um, another 40 or 50, I think. So he's killing it. He's just a couple years younger than me, so it's weird to say like this young kid, you know what I mean? But um, <laughs> I he, just, the time. <laughs> he reminds me of me a lot, and like um, um, we're a lot more similar. I'm finding out lately, lately than I even thought. Um, and, uh, but he is killing it and he's managing all my units and we have uh, a great relationship. Um, I'm a small investor in the company, so it behooves me to place my units with him as well. Um, and I wouldn't be able to, to hit those 400 units or even touch management of them without just in the bricks management. Very cool. So that's, uh, was that something that just kind of came up out of the blue or was no, it planned so, out? Yeah. So what happened was, um, I was, uh, I had a goal of 25 units and when I hit 25 units, I want to start an in-house property management company. So I'm gaining traction. I'm getting close to 25 units. Meanwhile, I wanted to hire an assistant personally as a realtor. And so I'm starting interviewing people as uh, an assistant, just an interview for the position. And after he left, I was like, that dude is motivated. Like he is, I was like, first I was super motivated. Reminds me of me. I cannot hire him out as an assistant no. because he he'll can't. be there for three months and then he'll right. own find a company. Him yeah, right. So, um, so I so I was maybe I was at the twenty five units or whatever it was. So like a few weeks later, I called him and I, um, or I texted him. I was like, "Hey, man, I don't think it's gonna work out. I'll let you know, whatever." And um, he's like, "No worries." I was like, "Let's be in touch. Let's figure something out." So a few weeks later, I called him. I was like, "Dude," I was like, "Do you want to start a property management company?" He's like, "Absolutely," <laughs> and he was managing student housing in West Virginia. 
um, managed like, I'm going to make, I'm going to be wrong. I think it was like 700 beds or something like that. And he had like 15 employees underneath them. And he's like, dude, I'm yes, absolutely. So we started meeting, putting things together and it's, we started the company as 50, 50 because my initial intentions were like, I'm going to do some property management. I might, you know, this and that it, it did not take long before I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to make property management or manage these units. And, um, and he's doing good. He's killing it. So, so I'm just a very small investor in that company. So I like the fact that you were, um, you know, I guess not too greedy and you were able to realize that the situation has turned into him basically running the entire company. You're like, Hey, look, why don't I just be a, a silent partner? I'm yes, a, that's exactly uh, what it is. Absolutely, man. This is not, I like to think that like, I do the right thing. You know what I mean? And he was just grinding and getting after it. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to have to give up my ownership like that. I didn't do anything. <laughs> period, you know? But, um, but I have helped out. I mean, I, I mean, I was able to help start the company because I, I started making a payment to bricks management throughout the States that I was managing before, you know? And so I was helping pay him, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's worked out. It's worked out. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I always see it. And I try and have the open line of communication with my partners. Like, uh, for instance, one of my partners, he's kind of the boots on the ground, managing all the projects. So similar to like what your brother's doing, only he's an equity owner in the company. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just like, dude, you need to get compensated for all the extra work you're doing. So we pay him like an upfront management fee, essentially, to, to manage the projects. And yeah. Because he deserves a comfortable living too, not just when closing happens. You absolutely. Know? So, absolutely. Uh, you got to be aware of those things. Uh, okay. So we're getting towards the end here. I don't want to keep you too long because obviously you're a busy guy. Uh, but I do want to touch on a couple of things. Can you, uh, you know, a lot of people listening, uh, not that we have a ton of listeners, but I'm sure that they all aspire to be bigger and, and better than they are currently. Uh, and you had some opportunities to have your own TV show. And a lot of people think that that's like the wow experience. Can you give us some pros and cons and maybe tell a little bit about uh, your experience with HGTV and, and things that happened after that? Yeah, for sure. So, um, uh, it, I, I personally initially was not approached by a production company. It was my business partner, Chris in life space. Okay. Mm -hmm. That I mentioned earlier, he flips houses as well. So this production company approached Chris and was like, we see you're flipping houses. Like we, we want to film you guys. So we sat down and, and with the production company. And as I mentioned previously, I was his agent listing all his properties. So we sat down with them and we Skype interviewed and I was dressed up and I had a bow tie on and, um, and they're like, we love you guys. Um, we have two requirements, and they're both for Jesse. We want him to keep his beard and wear a bow tie at all times. <laughs> so I was like, all right, you know, that sounds good. I'll run with the bow tie thing. Um, and so, so I was just a very small part of that show. Um, and we aired. We had 1.6 million viewers, and everything went really well. We thought we were going to get a season, but um, HGTV came back and was just like, hey, we're going to go a different direction. So it's kind of like as fast as it came, it went, you know. Um, but then fast forward to probably a year later, I was, I was heavy into Atlas Estates doing flips. And then, I, uh, we were approached by a production company and we sat down with them and I was like, I, w I went through this process before I'm familiar with it. So we took all these steps and it was going to be me as a developer investor, my fiance as my realtor, which is very true. And then my brother as my contractor. And so we took all these steps and it got to the point where like, yeah, we want to take the next step with you. I don't know what that would have turned into if it would have turned into a pilot episode or a season, but they said, but you have to commit to 10 houses a year, 10 flips. And at that time, it was only like my second year back into flipping. We were only doing like a couple a year, like three or four. And I was like, I know how much effort this takes. And I don't want to, like things are going well and I don't want to ruin it. So um, I said, no, at this point, like I can't commit to that. I don't want to ruin my business. Um, so it was, you know, kind of a bittersweet feeling. But as I mentioned to you earlier, it's like, and this is honestly got true. Like I am... I'm so happy where I'm at in life and everything is gone. And like, I love real estate so much. And, um, I was a little bit nervous that, uh, like if we did get a show and it turned into any type of fame or anything that, that my life would be going a different direction. And I didn't know if I was going to love that or not. And so, um, I think it's for the best that nothing ended up transpiring with that. So how long, uh, did it take to record one episode? Cause I've heard mixed things on this. I know somebody else who did an HGTV show. Yeah. Time. Well, I can tell you this. I remember this specifically. You do a sizzle reel before you get 
um, like it's a five minute video. Okay. A five minute video put together to pitch to HGTV or other um, networks. And um, I remember this specifically because it was like 24 hours of like two days, two days of 12 hour days. You know what I mean? Of filming and to put together a five minute. Just for the but, five minutes. Yeah. So the yeah. episode was, I can't put a time on it because it was throughout the renovation. Do you know what I mean? It was a lot of work for an hour, an hour episode. Well, I will say, I think the one really positive thing that came out of it is, and you may or may not rec- realize it, but uh, you've kind of created your image now because of the bow tie and the beard. That's exactly right. You yeah. have your image you can hang your hat on. I recently met with a guy who wants to get a real estate license, and he has a big afro. And I'm like, yeah. dude, you got to own this. This has to be part of your persona. And he was like on the fence about it. He's like, ah, I don't know. And I'm like, no, I'm telling you, that's what I would do. It's if I was huge. Finish. It's huge, man. So, you know, I want to touch base on this because – you're exactly right. It, it has created my image and I ran with that. And so um, with my company, Atlas Estates, I don't know if you, maybe you've noticed or haven't noticed this or not. Um, you will, if not, because you're paying attention now. But um, there's a lot of people that are flipping houses. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And um, so when I was working as an agent, heavy as an agent, I'd, be, I'd go into houses that are flipped. And the buyers, now they're like, hey, who flipped this house? Like, is it mom and pop? Like, what type of work is done? This and that. But you – they would never know unless you go to the site, like look into it. You know what I mean? They would never know just looking at the renovation. So every house that we renovate now, I incorporate a bow tie somewhere within the house. A couple houses ago, we had a wooden bow tie carved out the drywall, put it in the wall. Last house, um, the penny tile on the entry when you walk in, there's a bow tie in the penny tile. Uh, next house, we're doing custom metal railings, bow tie in the middle. So it will take some time, but I promise you, that we're building up this good reputation. When you see a house with a bow tie in it, you'll know that's Jesse Wig of Atlas Estates, and that's the plan. It's cool, but there's a whole other side of that, which you may or may not think about. And the reason why it's so hard to find out who's flipping these houses is because of the, the legal aspects of it, right? So let's say one of your contractors does something incorrectly, and then they, the buyer has, I think it's either three or five years to sue you down the road mm-hmm. for the work that you did on the property. So like what a lot of these flippers are doing nowadays is they're, and I don't know how many people know this, but they're, you know, they'll do it for one or two years, then they'll close that LLC. So now they can't be sued anymore and they'll open a new LLC and, and keep flipping. So are you using the same entity the whole time? Uh, I primarily do use the same entity, but here's the thing. I mean, I, I, I do separate certain projects. I'm buying a school. 50,000 square foot high school we're putting in a separate entity so there there are certain things I put in separate entities but this is my thing this could be bad business I don't know but I'm gonna say it I um it's it's so important to me to to put out a good product and to stand behind the product that we um put together or put out there that like there will be issues you're going to run into issues there's things we overlook there's things that happen but like I am it's more important to me to put out a good product and address those issues for years to come and be a man of my word. And I put my face out there. I'm Jesse Wade with Atlas Estates. This is my product. You know what I mean? To where, um, then it is for me to make a ton of money or close LLCs years later because you don't want to get sued because you made it shitty work or whatever the number is. You know what I mean? Um, but that, that's a gamble I'm willing to take. I respect that. I like that a lot. Uh, not a lot of people are willing to stand behind their work and uh, not that they, I don't think they intentionally like to do shady work. It's just in the, in the world that we live in. I mean, it, you're getting sued left and right Absolutely. for stupid stuff all the time, you know? So, Absolutely. Uh, okay. So moving forward, there's one last question before we get into the, the blitz round and that's, you got to tell me one and you're good with stories. So this should work. <laughs> for you you got to tell me the, the most funny or the first funny story that comes to your, your brain about your career in real estate and just one that just it always is going to stick with you. Oh, God, that's so much pressure. <laughs> let, me, let me say this before I come up with a story. Um, just the other day, my fiance, uh, she was like, oh, this is your favorite song or this is your favorite food. I don't know why this weighs head with me, but I don't like to designate like, yes, this is my favorite something. Now, you're asking me a question for like the story that sticks your favorite out. Favorite yeah, funny you know story, I mean? yep. And I can't commit to that right now. I, um, I, um, let's see, you know what I want to say that this isn't, this hasn't happened yet. This okay. is going to happen. Okay. It's okay. going to happen. You're telling me a future I, story. I am go- this is going to happen. Okay. And I'm so excited about this story that, um, it, it may be my highlight. You know what I mean? That was all. So we're closing on that 50,000 square foot high school. Right. This week should have happened today. Now it's happened to Thursday. Um, 
and we're going to put together some really cool marketing videos. So the first thing we're going to do before we even start renovating this is we're buying a couple go-karts, we're buying a bunch of paintball guns, and we're putting three balloons off the back of the go-karts. And then um, we're going to set up the, the stairs to have boards <laughs> I know where you're stairs, going with already. And we're going to do a real live Mario, Mario Kart. Kart. Yep. And we're going to rip around and we're going to shoot down the, um, the balloons. And if you three your balloons pop, then you're out. You know what I mean? So we're going to do a ton of filming. I'm starting a YouTube channel um, very soon. And um, that will probably be the first thing we launch. That's you know? awesome. So I get it, you, you'll have to watch for that. Yeah, Jesse Way got us to stay. You got to invite me. I want to be there. You're, you're in. All right. You're in. I don't. I don't need to drive. I just want to watch. Gotcha. You know? like, I don't need to. I, I've, I've been shot enough times <laughs> in baseball games. So. Gotcha. Uh, okay. So before we move forward, then real quick, so you, you bought this fifty thousand square foot high school, right? Yeah. I've thought about it before. I've seen because uh, in in our area, uh, if anybody's listening from out of town, the city of Pittsburgh sold off a bunch of its schools pretty cheap too. I don't know what you acquired yours for a real good number a real good number so i think the one i was looking at was like two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. but you just can't buy like real estate that 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 much real estate for two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. but it's the question is what do you do with it yeah right because that's like i thought about it and then like i racked my brain with like 300 million ideas and i couldn't come up with it so what in the world are you doing with this high school well see now i'm gonna the the short answer is i don't know okay? okay But I got it for such a good number that worst case scenario, if I run through 300, did you say 300 million? 300, 300 million. million yeah. Yeah. If I run through 300 million ideas and none of those work from a financial standpoint or zoning or any other challenges you, you face, I can list it for sale on the active market and sell it and get my money back. You know? So okay. um, now I don't, I want it. Right. And I'm going to, I'm going to make something happen. We're obviously considering the idea of converting into apartments. Um, we're looking into it costs a lot of money. Absolutely. Yeah. I had someone tell me they think, um, around the 3 million to 4 million mark. Um, so I have to raise some funds. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, but also looking into it's starting to gain uh, a lot of attention is like the co working space, you know, so yeah. multiple different companies in a building where they have community space. I mean, it's so cool. We have a full gymnasium, we have a full auditorium. So people, I'm just getting ideas left and right. Like, hey, you should use this auditorium for um, a music uh, wedding venue or a music venue. Hey, you could use the gymnasium for like a flea market. So like, there's just, there's a lot of options that we're going to be looking into and seeing what makes sense from the number standpoint and also working with community and, and kind of seeing what they would like to see as well. So hopefully we can find a common ground and, and make that come well, you're, together. You're pretty good at hoops. I saw the video of you uh, shooting hoops there. You know so. what? And I have to say this because this is the truth. That was the first take. It was one and done. I got. I, you were nothing but net. You yeah, know, yeah. That was the first take. No, and I said, I think I said swish or something too. Yeah. That was lucky. Okay, that doesn't happen. But the truth is, that was the first cut. What about on the other one? You're on the like, hoverboard. Uh, no, that was I'm not. I tried a million times. Okay. Yeah. So right. that's the truth there. But the the swish at the foul line or moonwalk to the swish. That was one cut. All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll take your word for it. Yep. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna enter the blitz round. I ask the same five questions that everybody comes on. Uh, what's your favorite technology tool? I'm going to say the Atlas Estates app. It's not out yet. That's what I'm going to be What is the Atlas Estates app? Yeah, so um, my Droid app is done or Android app is done, and um, the Apple app will be done here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, to summarize, it's um, an app that allows all my private money investors to um, track their funds, watch the progress of the house, any changes, any updates, um, and watch their money accrue interest. Wow, yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's going to be cool. I think that you should uh, license that technology out for other other. Flippers. I had two other people tell me that. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of kinks I got to work out on at first. I kept coming back to this developer saying, can I add to this? Can I add to this? So so where did you get the developer from, like Fiverr? Or? I did, Fiverr. Yeah. It's okay. a killer site. It's awesome. I've yeah. hired people from there all the time. Yeah. What's your favorite real estate book? Um. Honestly, uh, the cell, the sale, the cell, the cell, the okay. cell by Frederick. Okay, million dollar list in New York. Yep. Um, Frederick, I forget uh, yeah, Euclid. I, oh, Euclid. Frederick yeah. Euclid. It was my favorite book. Really? Yeah. Like, what about the book did you like? Um, uh, it was very interesting to me to see his story and the progression of like how he went from not having a real estate license to getting his real estate license to killing it. Hmm. That's it. I'm adding it to my list. It's, right it's, after it's this. interesting. I mean, obviously, uh, most people say like you know, 
Robert Kiyosaki. I was going to say, or, your step four dad. Your step right four dad is a reading, millionaire real estate agent. I'm reading or, 10X now with Grant Cardone. It's a good you know, one. Yeah. Um, and Relentless, which is not a real estate book, um, but it's it's awesome. So if you weren't in real estate, what would you be doing? Owning some other company. <laughs> um, you have no idea what that other company would be? No, I'm looking at houses in Florida right now. We're looking to get a snowbird house. And I was telling Marissa that my fiance that I was like, Hey, when I'm down here, I'm going to start a, a landscaping company. I don't know what it would be. I don't know. I don't know what it would be. I would own another company. And I, um, what, what would I do? Probably something in the service industry. I, I like to talk to people. I you're like gonna, to be involved. You're going to mow lawns with a bow tie and a beard? <laughs> hey, whatever I have to do. Yeah, and I've said this before off the podcast. I'm very jealous of your beard because I can't grow <laughs> it. So I like it. Well, it took years. It took years. <laughs> and, and just for the record, this is honey brown. It's not red. So honey, the, brown, honey brown. Honey brown. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so just. Uh, I'm going to hold back all my uh, redhead jokes right now. <laughs> so. uh, what's your favorite hobby? Um. God, I can't say real estate, right? You can't say real estate. Outside of real estate, what's your favorite hobby? Is is working out a hobby? Sure. I'll say that. I'm hit or miss. Um, working out. I re- working really out. I really enjoy just, yeah. Like strength training or a cardio? Little bit of, I mean, I do a little bit of cardio, a little bit of strength tra- strength tra- uh, training. Um, I, I feel so good afterwards. It's like yeah. – there's a science behind it. You know, well, look, we can, we can do this. We're on video. So if you want to go check it on YouTube, this is what, uh, you know, somebody works out. <laughs> this is somebody who doesn't like to work out. What we look hey, like. Hey, I, I saw your post lately. You're getting into it. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I work out. I just don't like to work out. So <laughs> I got gotcha. you. There's a difference. I guess that's true. <laughs> All right. So last question. What's your dream vacation? Um, we've been doing a lot of traveling lately. Um this might sound dumb because I'm not going to say some crazy country. Uh, when we, it will be to hop in a van and travel to the United States um, and stop in spot to spot, but just uh, like a um, camper van. I don't think that's dumb. I mean, I, I did a lot of, like, we grew up poor, uh, yeah. you know, and, and my mom just used to say, well, our summer vacation was get in the, our crappy car and let's drive around. We stayed in crappy motels and we just explored the U.S. That's pretty cool. That's really that's cool. That's like part of my childhood, you know. I'll yeah. never forget that. I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's a thousand places I want to go to and I travel to, you know what I mean? Um, but I, I just think it would be – my fiancé and I did that in Iceland. We went to Iceland last year, I think, and we rented a camper van and traveled for six days around the mm-hmm. island of the continent. It was unbelievable. Yeah. And I don't think the United States has – it probably doesn't have quite the scenery. Probably not. You know what I mean? But I have heard from this older couple when we were on the plane, they were like, you know, you're traveling all over the place and there's so many good sites in the United States. I was like, all right, well, we'll check it out. So we're, we're, we we're want to eventually get a camper van or make a make a camper van and make put it. our dogs. Yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. why not? Yeah. That's awesome. That's a, great, that's a great idea. I mean, I, I can see myself. I always say when I – I'm never going to fully retire, but when I do retire, I'm going to travel a lot. Yeah. You know, I can see myself having like an RV or something where, you know, so I don't have to buy a place in Dallas. I can just, I'm a Cowboys fan. Oh, I got that. So I got to have those season tickets. So yeah. I got to get down there when I can. Coming from the Pittsburgh podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So, hey man, thanks for coming. I really appreciate all your time. Uh, you didn't have to do it, but. Uh, Thank you for having me. We're going to get you all blast out. Where can people find more about you, Jesse? You know, I think the best place is just follow me on Instagram at Jesse Wig, J-E-S-S-E-W-I-G. And from there, you can link up to every company I'm involved in. Awesome. Well, hey, go follow Jesse, and uh, we'll talk to you soon, Jesse. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, guys. Well, another great podcast. Uh, follow Jesse on Instagram and check out his companies. You can also follow me on Instagram at ENS Hoover or on Twitter at ENS Hoover. Or visit our website, dhrea.com, for more information on our company and uh, we'll check you out on the next episode.